Well, we've been on quite a journey through chapter one, and we are now in the last section, section 1.4. And in this section, we are going to make use of what we learned about floating point numbers and how they're constructed, and see that we have to be careful with them when we're performing ordinary arithmetic operations. Without some care, we can end up losing all the precision in the numbers in one or two steps. It doesn't take much. Uh, we're going to look at why this happens and how to avoid it. In order to do that, we're going to look at a sample subtraction. We're going to take the sine of x and subtract x from it. Now we know from the Taylor series that the sine of x is closely related to x. And in fact, for small values of x, the sine of x should look very similar to x. That's going to demonstrate the core of the problem that we're going to have, and that is subtracting any two numerically similar numbers. That's going to end up causing us loss in data. So let's take a look at a table that was created from Excel. We're going to start with x equals pi over 4, so we have 0.7854 radians. Now that's not really a very small angle, so when we take the sine of it and take the difference between x and its sine, uh, we expect to get something different as we see here on the first row of the table entry. If we cut x in half, bringing it down to just below 0.4, and then redo this difference, uh, well, we see that those are in fact quite a bit closer, as we would expect to occur. We continue to build this table by dividing x by 2 uh, with every new row. And as we compare the difference between x and sine of x, we can see that the two functions are getting quite close. Now, so far, no surprises. And as we continue the table to this right-hand side, these differences are indeed getting very small until when, by the time you get to the end of the table, you've hit zero. Now, we know that x and the sine of x are never exactly the same. We also know from the last few sections that there are gaps in our floating point real. So clearly what's happened here at the bottom, we've just come too close to zero, and the computer can't get any more precision. It just gives up and gives us a zero. So far, that's no problem. The question that I want to raise is, are the numbers preceding this, are these subtracted numbers actually any good, or could they be degrading? And the answer is the fact that they are degrading, and we really don't know how fast. Uh, so let's, let's go to page 59 in your book, where a rather useful theorem is, pre is presented to us. Uh, and it's a theorem that helps us look at the degradation that occurs as you start subtracting similar numbers. So we have two numbers. We have x and we have y. We've put them both in floating point notation. We are going to have x bigger than y just for convenience. The same thing would happen if we had y greater than x. But we will entertain allowing x and y get somewhat close. We're going to put uh, the difference of x and y into a slightly different form. We're going to take 1 minus the ratio of y over x, but with very little algebra you can see that this is really getting at the same point. Uh, 1 and y over x will be two numbers that are quite similar if y and x are getting close together. So this theorem says that you can trap the error caused by this difference between two integers, q and p. We're going to let p get larger and larger until 2 to the minus p is just slightly underneath that difference. And we're going to let q be an integer and have it get smaller and smaller until 2 to the minus q is slightly larger than that difference. What the theorem says is the act of subtracting y from x will result in a loss of significant digits somewhere between q and p. So as these two numbers start getting close, that difference is very small, and it takes a larger value of q to set an upper bound for the number of lost significant digits. That's scary because we only have 15 to begin with, even in double precision real. Uh, so this is a warning. 
that we will be losing significant amounts of data if we allow ourselves to take a difference of numbers that are close together. What can we do to fix that? Well, our Taylor series comes back to help us as it will continue to do throughout the entire quarter. And we're reminded that the sine of x has a Taylor expansion as what you see here on the screen. With a minor rewrite of this Taylor expansion, we can form that difference between the x and the sine of x and simply express it into a few terms of the Taylor expansion. Now, as long as x is small, the uh, error term associated with is going to be a power of x divided by a factorial. So if we had chosen to use the first two terms of the Taylor series, our error term would be nearly x to the seventh over five factorial. Well, you can imagine if x is 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to the seventh power is very small, and by the time you divide that by seven factorial, you have almost nothing left. So just using these two terms for even moderately small value of x should give us a very accurate alternative to calculating x minus the sine of x. To see that, let's bring back our table and we'll add a column to it. So these first two columns that you see on both sides of the table are just what we had before. And we're competing with the direct calculation of x minus the sine of x with that Taylor series that we had on the previous page. Now, as x is pretty large, really, uh, we're pretty happy with these, these comparisons. Uh, they are a little bit different from each other, but not a lot. So even with a rather large value of x, the Taylor series doesn't do badly. Uh, by the time you get down to less than 0.2 radians, you can't even see a difference between them. They're, they're virtually identical. As you start getting down into the yellow region, you can start seeing a little bit of difference between the difference of x and the sine x and the Taylor series. It's showing up in this last displayed decimal point. Now keep in mind that that's only the fifth significant digit in our double precision reels, which should have 15 significant digits. So if I've already lost uh, a significant digits in the fifth place, I've damaged a major portion of what was in that number. That's not good. Now, that means I probably should be marking another yellow marks even farther up if I want to preserve more uh, significant digits. And as I continue to work down, say, towards the end of this region, I have now created a significant amount of error in the third significant digit place. Uh, so this, this whole set of numbers is contaminated. Uh, you might say, well, that's close enough for my work, but it isn't because you're probably going to be using this data with other similarly damaged data and doing things like adding them up, uh, and that will actually increase the variability even more. Uh, so you don't want to be damaging uh, anything uh, of any significance at all in your word. Well, fixing it's no problem. We just use the Taylor series. Uh, here's a sample MATLAB uh, function that would do just that. And, and all you really need to do, if you understand how much the damage is going to be, is take the value of x, in this case just compare it to see if its magnitude is too large. Here I'm using 0.001, which is probably overkill. And when I make that check, I'll be happy to take x minus the sine of x. Otherwise, I'll use this uh, polynomial, this Taylor polynomial, as an alternative. Now this is a really simplistic function. You might be able to do better than that and have other criteria of, of where you want to do the checking, but it gives you the idea that you don't have to blindly just stick in a formula. Uh, you may want to do some alternatives based on the error proneness of the formula that you're using. So that was a nice, quick, easy fix. And, and you can do that in other places as well. So I'd like to give you a chance now to try your hand at uh, some of these problems and some of these issues that we've been discussing in chapter one. And we'll start with looking at a formula involving a sample average and variance. Now you're looking at this mu hat here, sometimes it's written as x bar, and we're saying it's defined, the sample average is defined as adding up all measured values, all n of them, and then dividing this sum by the total. So that we're going to call the sample average.
If you take a course in statistics, and you may have already done so, you'll see that a formula that's used to define the sample variance, uh, which is called sigma hat squared, is accomplished through taking the deviations of each of the measured values uh, from this same sample average, square that deviation, add up those squares, and divide by one minus or one less than this, the sample size. That gives you the sample variance, which also happens to be the square of the sample standard deviation. You'll also notice that your books give you an alternate formula, where instead of taking the difference first, squaring them and adding them up, uh, they suggest you add up the squares of the data values, and when you're done, you subtract off n times the sample average squared. Take that difference and then divide that by one less than the sample size. So your homework here is first to prove that mathematically these two formulas are identical. Uh, the second part is to make an argument from a numerical point of view that these two formulas are not identical and one of them will contribute to more numerical error than the other. I want you to tell me which one you think is better and which is worse and why. This is a verbal discussion or a, a, a basically just a uh, logical explanation based on what we've covered. I want you to think through what we've covered and write down your reasons why one should be better than the other and that will be turned in as hand homework and scanned and turned in in the normal manner. Uh, the rest of it is uh, from the book. Uh, go to section 1-4 and do problems 1 and 3. Again, and this is the ordinary section, not the computer section. But your book asks you a somewhat subtle question here and asks, is there a difficulty in problem 3 when x gets close to 1? I want you to tell me if there is or isn't, and if there is, why? What is, what is the reason behind that? Uh, so that now wraps up not only this section, it wraps up the entire chapter 1, and next time we're going to be moving off into our study of matrices. We'll review vectors and matrices and different matrix operations fairly quickly. I've assumed you've already had linear algebra, so we're going to race through that fairly fast. And we're going to move on from there into numerical approaches of handling uh, matrices and doing the matrix operations that you are used to in linear algebra. So with that, we will see you next time as we enter into Chapter 2.